Hi there, this is Daniel, and welcome back. This is part two of the special episode, The Hanning Family Vacation. Yes, we were headed for the Texas Hill Country, to a campsite near Devil's Backbone. As I remember, my eldest brother Ken was at a camping event with the Explorer Scouts there. It was this year and for many years to come, just my dad, my mom, Daryl, and myself. My father had rented a little pop-up wagon, which hooked to the back of our Ford station wagon. This was a first, and promised much more time camping and spending time with the family, and a lot less time actually having to set up camp. That would be a blessing if it worked out as planned. I went with my father to pick out and pick up the camper. That year, my father and I had taken down the baker tent and looked it over as usual. But this year, it was just going to take too long. There was a bad storm last year while we were camping, and there was water damage. Eyelets torn out, flooring torn and wet, and the window covers, all of them needed work. It could not get done in the two days, one weekend, that usually the Hanning family spent on the tent. My father and mother discussed it. First, we, meaning the whole family, could spend two weekends, two weeks, two weekends, working on the tent together. Second, my father and I could work on the tent a little at a time for the next two months. Or we could get a motel room, or we could rent a trailer or a pop-up camper. It wasn't a long discussion. The Hannings were not about to pay to stay in a motel, and spending two weekends camped in the garage together sewing and cleaning, well, that was not going to happen either. I was glad. I didn't want to have to deal with four different kinds of stitching and somebody forgetting to use cord on the eyelets and not thread. Uh, this would work out just fine. Or so I thought. The drive was incredibly comfortable. There wasn't a tent or poles and ropes, so it was actually spare room in the back of the station wagon. We were on the highway out of town when it dawned on me there was room enough back there to sit in the back of the station wagon. I promptly headed past the boxes and bags, medical supplies and bottled water, and found a spot to burrow in right by the back window. Once properly burrowed into the supplies, and having found some peanut butter crackers all the while, I settled to watch the Houston skyline grow smaller and smaller in the back window of that station wagon. With it went all my anxieties and fears. For the next two weeks, I would forget about school and its dynamics. I would actually relax. I fell asleep, burrowed into the back of that station wagon, and awoke to the vehicle slowing and making a right turn. We were pulling in somewhere off the highway. How long had I been asleep? I sat up. Actually, at the perfectly wrong time. As I was shifting my weight from my legs up to my arms, Dad hit a pothole and sent me flying. Yes, small children can fly. I went face first into a pile of blankets. How fortunate, you might say. No. Nah, no such luck for Danny. Under the blankets was what stopped my heart right now. Two things. First thing, I actually experienced a moment of unexpected glee when I saw I was headed into the blankets and sleeping bags. Then I remembered why they were laid out and not folded and rolled up. Second thing, the feeling of glee was short-lived. When I remembered two more things, the blankets were laid out that way because they were covering a very large metal ice chest. Second, our family ice chest was huge and it was made of, of course, metal. Just nanoseconds before I struck the ice chest with my face, I realized I was headed face first towards our metal ice, ice chest. I think I got out a small vocalization, not even such so much as a word, more like a gulp or a sharp sigh. Then Danny was one with the family, large, really heavy, I remember it took two of us to move the darn thing, metal, 
Everyone else had plastic cooler or even styrofoam. Why did we have to have a metal chest? Ice chest. Boom, bang, clang! Just as my father put the brakes on to stop in front of the station, I made contact with the family's metal ice chest. With a large yet muffled bang, I hit the pile of blankets with my face and the metal ice chest below. There was a loud bang of metal hitting car interior plastic. The plastic always loses. Lying against the blankets, I could feel on my face the cold air beneath. I suddenly hear my father's voice. Danny, you having fun back there? <laughs> I giggle and respond, just learning to fly, Dad. Now Daryl has turned around and is laughing under his breath at me. I shake my head, rub my face. Having just landed on my face, I wanted to make sure that everything was still there and all right. Everything was where it was supposed to be. It seemed to be in the correct place. Nothing was bleeding. It was a good landing, I said mostly to myself. I was getting up and walking away. That meant good landing. We were headed into the 7-Eleven, my father and I. This was not like my father. He didn't shop at 7-Eleven. So he walks in, holds the door open for me. I walk in, and my father speaks. We are just here for some charcoal and lighter fluid, Danny. And there it was, black and white. Usually we would eat when the camp was made and the fire was ready and not before. But it seems this trip, the campfire was there for heat, s'mores, and decoration. Nothing more. There was a small gas burner in the pop-up, but that was more for like breakfast and coffee. We were going to go to a, we were going to a nice campsite. They would have barbecue grills at all of the campsites. As we're standing at the checkout, my father put his hand under my chin, looked at my face closely. You okay, right? Sheepishly, I laugh and respond, Yes, just trying to fly in the station wagon. You can't say I never tried. We both laugh and come to the counter and pay. As we step outside, my father reminded me of the rules of the road. You know better about getting up in a moving vehicle. If you didn't before, you'll remember now. <laughs> we got into the station wagon and headed back under the highway. Now, if you were to give me a map of Texas, and I'm being honest here and it's not disparaging, I couldn't find this part of the hill country. If you were holding a gun to my head, honest, I, I couldn't. Well, it was after nightfall when we pulled into the campgrounds. I was awake this time, coming into the parking lot, so there was a no repeat of the flying incident. Well, yes, I got back into the tailgate area. Of course I got back there. The view was just incredible. I sat and watched as the land passed by for hours and hours and hours. I was glad we were here. Now it was time to see if this pop-up thing that had been following us everywhere was going to be as easy as it looked at the dealership. We arrived at the campgrounds late afternoon, just long enough to get assigned to space, unpack, and get the camper opened before nightfall. Looked like things were going to go as planned. My father ran a tight ship. Speaking of ships, while we were in the campground store office, I saw a small plastic boat for sale. It looked just like the tri-hull bass boat that my father and I used when we were having vacation at the doctor's cabins. It was blue and white, just like theirs. It was tri-hull, too. I took it over my father and asked if he would buy it for me. This is not like the kind of thing my father spent money on. He, he wasn't big on impulse purchases, and they were greatly discouraged in the house. But for whatever reason, he looked at the boat, and then he mentioned the same thing I did, that it looked like the boat we usually go fishing from. And he said, yes. We walked back out to the station wagon, me with my boat in hand, and headed to the campsite. We'd locked out. This site was right near a stream and the showers and concession stand. It'd be a little noisier at night because of the concession stand and the showers, but I really liked the location. My father, uh, I like my father and I left Daryl and Mom with the station wagon and headed back to the now disconnected pop-up camper. This was the moment of truth. Was the hype 
true? Would this camper save us hours of time, usually spent setting up the Baker tent? Would it be as the dealer told us, easy as pie to set up? This was it. I stood beside the, the, the pop-up and watched for it getting caught on tree branches or anything that was hanging near the camper. My father went around to each side unfastening the tie-downs and lifting the fiberglass topper to make sure that it was free. Then he headed around to the front of the camper. It was time for the great unpacking. There was the crank assembly at the front of the camper. When, you un when the fasteners were unloosened, you cranked the handle, and the camper was to unfold and pop up. Well, one thing for sure, it made a heck of a lot of noise. There were loud pops and grinding noises as the fiberglass clamshell opened. The grinding came as the muslin and mosquito netting top came rising out of the interior of the camper. Amazing. This puppy was opening just exactly like the demo did at the dealership where my, my father and I picked the camper. Within five minutes, the fiberglass too had become the wings of the canvas top partially rising above. It had frigging worked. Either my father or neither my father or I said a word, but if you'd looked, you would have known we were very happy. We still had to go inside and uh, move up some poles to hold the canvas topper and the wings where the beds were located. There were so supports that we had to extend and fasten down. But just like the dealer had told us, within five minutes, we were ready to occupy the camper. I was sweaty, and honestly, I think I got more than my fair share of road grime sitting in the back of the station wagon. So I decided I'd go and take a shower before we ate. Dad was helping Mom getting everything she needed into the tiny kitchenette. <laughs> kitchenette. It was a hot plate we brought and a sink, a pseudo sink, some kitchenette. Daryl was over by the fire playing with my boat. I grabbed some clothes, a bar of soap, and a washcloth, and headed for the showers. In a few short moments, I would be clean of the day's filth and ready to eat. As I walked away, I looked back on my family. Dad and Mom were working together to set up dinner. Dad was now starting the grill with the charcoal and the lighter fluid we had bought. Mom was in the kitchen of the camper, preparing beans most likely and Daryl was still over by the fire playing with my boat. I hate public showers. Side note, I was living on a boat for a time in King Harbor in Redondo Beach, living on a nice 30-foot Catalina boat. And of course, there's no real showers or bath facilities when you're in harbor. So every morning I'd have to get up and go take a shower in the, uh, the yacht club and use the bathrooms every morning. And I hated that too. I hate public showers, but at KOA, that is all there is. So, I just grit my teeth, shower, and leave. Now, I'm done, and I'm headed back to the campsite. I see Dad by the grill. Looks like the hamburgers are ready, and I can smell them from almost 20 feet away. Mom is coming out of the camper with a big pot, most likely full of beans. Beans. I never understood why. When the family, the whole family, was fixing to spend the night together in a confined space, be it a tent or a camper, Mom always fed us beans. I didn't see Daryl anywhere around the campsite, nor did I see my toy boat. I walked into the camp area. Boy, Dad, those hamburgers smell really good. How long till we eat? Not looking up from the grill, not missing a beat. My father says, about five minutes, Danny, and we can eat. Have you seen your brother? My father always did have this really uncanny way of reading my mind. I was just thinking that very thought. Where was Daryl? No, I, I didn't see him. He was here by the fire when I went to get a shower. He, he was playing with my boat. Well, Danny, flipping hamburgers, 
do your mother and I a favor and go find him, okay? If he was playing with your boat, try over by the stream we passed coming in. Good call, Dad. So I grabbed a long stick. I always liked having a walking stick when I was out camping. So I'd pick up a, a big, large tree branch and clean it off with my knife and make a little walking stick. So I grabbed a walking stick and headed away from the camp site towards the sound of water. Okay, little background here. At the time of this vacation, I was seven and Daryl would have been nine. My father and I had started a year or so earlier spending a lot of time together in the garage. Most every night I was in the garage, unless the Red Skelton show was on or later Star Trek. Those two shows I would always stay inside to watch. But during this period of time, for about a year or so before this camping trip, my father and I had grown closer, and Daryl and I had started drifting apart. I mean, I didn't even think about it when it happened. And it, it just seemed kind of natural that I started spending more time with my father and less time with my brother, Daryl. But we were seven and nine, we were still really young, and we, were, we were, weren't as close as we had been, as I mentioned in earlier stories. As I walked to the stream with my father, the father we had mentioned, I started hearing the sound of water. Lots of water. And it was rushing very fast. Again, I'm seven years old. So remember that as I tell this tale. Things seemed bigger at that age. I am not sure I would see it the same way if I were to go there today. So I'm listening to the sound of water. It's getting louder and louder and louder as I come around the bend in the road. Suddenly, I hear, slightly over the sound of the water, the sound of my brother Daryl's voice. I look to my left, and lo and behold, there's my boat. I follow the string up to the right that I had tied to the boat, and I see my brother hanging from the side of the rock, a rock, in the middle of this stream. At my age and size, they looked like rapids. But in the middle of the stream was my brother desperately hanging onto an outcrop of rocks about 10 to 12 feet off the path. He was caught in a strong current and hanging on by one hand. Trailing out behind him was the string I attached to the toy boat and my boat. This was not difficult to figure out. Daryl had taken my boat to play with. No biggie, we shared toys. While he was playing with my boat, sitting or standing on some rocks and playing with a string to let the bow, bow, you know, get caught in the current, he had fallen. Fallen off the rocks and right into a very strong current. This current looked like it could easily carry him off very far downstream. This was not good. My first impulse was to tell Daryl to let go of the dang boat and grab the rocks with both hands. I tried. I yelled at him. And he yelled back, Danny, just help me. Reach over here and grab my hand. Here, I'm thinking still that why doesn't he let go of the freaking boat? Sure, I can take one hand, which is holding the rock, but wouldn't it be better if he let go of the boat and then I grab one hand and he holds onto the rocks with the other? Nah, too much thinking. Daryl was screaming. Daryl was screaming. Never saw that before. And I had to do something. I had my walking stick in my right hand. And my left hand was on the ground. Now, I looked around by my left hand. And to my left, there was a small bush into the ground. I grabbed a hold of the bush with my left hand and extended the walking stick with my right hand out toward Daryl. Daryl reached out to grab the stick. But his right hand slipped and he pulled back closer to the rock face. I spread out my legs for better stability and reached out as far as my right arm can stretch, then looked at my left, pulled the bush with my left arm as far as they could stretch. Then I turned back to my right, facing Daryl, just in time to see him grab the end of the walking stick. It was working. I shifted my grip on the walking stick to get a better purchase. Unfortunately, 
At the very same time, it appeared Daryl was shifting his weight from the purchase on the rocks to the walking stick. This had a bad result. I was shifting, he was grabbing. It all happened so very quickly. One moment, Daryl was pulling himself out of the rapids with my walking stick. The very next moment, the stick had left my hand. Daryl smartly let go of the walking stick and gained purchase on the rocks further downstream. He actually floated downstream more. Now he was in some very deep water and the current was getting stronger. I moved down shore to get closer to Daryl. I run over to the closest point I could get to Daryl and stepped out onto the rocks. Aye, there's the rub. As soon as I set foot on the rocks, I understood what had happened to Daryl. These rocks were frickin' slimy. I bet he lost his footing while playing with a boat, like I said. Second thing I noticed? Boy, the boat surely... <laughs> if I looked down at the boat, it looked really real in the rapids. It was bobbing and turning, and it looked real. It just struck me. With the water rushing past it and the size of the waves against it, it looked really real. I was getting distracted. I reached out to grab my brother's hand. Something inside me at this point said, Danny, this is a bad idea. But I reached out and grabbed my brother's hand. Have you, dear reader, have you ever grabbed the hand of someone in distress or imminent peril? We should all be taught this at the age like two. He grabbed my hand hard and started pulling. He didn't let go of the boat still and started trying to pull himself up on the rock with me. I was losing my footing on the slimy rocks and I feared Daryl's fate would soon be mine. Let go of the string, Daryl! Let go of the boat! He wasn't listening. I saw him look back at the boat and then up at me. He was smiling. It looked like he was actually going to pull himself out with my help. When everything again went to crap. First thing I remember is my feet lost any connection they had to the world and the slimy rocks I was standing on. And I found myself legs up on my butt. Daryl dropped back into the water and panic, a panicked look swept across his face. Just as I was noticing that, my feet went up further and my butt slid off the rock as I plunged butt first into the rushing waters beside Daryl. I still had Daryl's hand in mine when I realized I was in the water. And the water was really, really cold. And it was coming very fast. Dang it, I'd just taken a shower. Now I was going to have to shower all over again, and dinner would be cold. The water just kept rushing into my mouth, up on my face, all over. I had to turn my head away. I put Daryl's hand back on the rock and turned to my left, back towards the shore. There was nobody with an eye shot. Right then, that moment, I knew the fear my brother had been feeling all along. Stuck in rushing water and nobody in eyesight to help. I looked over my shoulder to the right at Daryl. He had finally let go of that dang boat. It was floating down the rapids, bobbing left and then right, making a course through the currents. Looking at Daryl, I noticed he looked kind of gray. His eyes didn't seem to be focusing. This was not going to be a tenable situation for long. If we didn't get help soon, we both were headed downstream, and there were a lot of sharp rocks. I started thinking, what, what could I do? What could I do? I was now in the water. There was no way I could help Daryl, but I had to help us. I didn't know how much time had passed as these thoughts passed through my mind. I was keeping my head out of the water, and I had a good purchase on the rock, but not enough strength and purchase to pull myself out of the current. Next thing I noticed, I was getting cold. I mean, really cold. My feet were tingling. I looked downstream again and saw the little blue boat crash against some large boulders. If I didn't act soon, that would be Daryl. And then me. 
I screamed. I'm no freaking hero. I didn't think about this. I just screamed. I lowered my voice and I tried screaming. I listened. I could tell. The sound of the river was low frequency. It was drowning out my voice. Do you like that? It was, I was in the water, drowning in the river, and the river was drowning out my voice. Get it? Anyway. I had to go higher. Oi. I was going to regret this. I just knew it. But I raised my voice to its highest falsetto and screamed at the top of my lungs. Help! Help us! Over here! Help! To the top of my frigging lungs, I screamed. Again and again, I screamed. The third time I started screaming, I saw a young man come around the bend, running. I turned to Daryl, tried to smile. There was help on the way. Over here! Please help us! The young man came to the shore, grabbed my hand from the side of the stream, not the rocks like I had tried, and pulled me out of the river. He then grabbed Daryl's hands and pulled him out of the Darryl, well, out of the river. Daryl ran off, soaking wet and really upset. I turned to the young man and said, Thank you. You just saved my life and my brother's. He smiled and laughed. Oh, I don't know about that. You weren't too far from the shore. I looked back, and he was, he was right. We weren't too far from the shore. But in the river, in the water with it going so fast, it seemed like it was really far away. I asked the young man if he wanted to walk back to our camp, that my father would be grateful. When a nice-looking teenage girl walked up, he smiled and said he had better things to do. I headed back towards camp soaking wet. You know how your shoes do that when you, yeah, doing that all the way back in the dirt to the camp. When I got to camp, Mom was with Daryl inside the camper, and Dad was sitting calmly by the fire, eating. I sat down beside him. He handed me a plate of burgers and a, yes, beans. I shivered a little bit. He reached over, took a blanket from a pile beside the picnic table, and wrapped it around me. Then he says in a calm, quiet voice, I hear you had some excitement. The handing gift of under, under, understatement strikes again. Yes, there was some excitement, some, some rushing water, some falling, and then Daryl and I were both in the water. <laughs> My father laughs and then asks, is that when you started screaming, Danny? Oh, hold on. Creep factor really high. How did he know that I was screaming? What? What did Daryl tell you? He laughs again. Daryl didn't say a word. Just ran into the camper with Mom following him. I looked up perplexed. Then, how? I heard you, Danny. Rather... The whole camp heard you. That's the end of part two, the Hanning family vacation. I'd like to thank everyone for watching and being a part of the Indiegogo campaign that is still running. I'm still trying to meet a higher go. We're looking now at $7,000 to cover the cost of a power chair, me moving, getting into a safer place with an elevator. I've outlined it online. But again, thank you, everybody, for all your help. Thank you for still contributing, and I've gotten contributions in the past week. Thank you very much, and may God bless.